What's the trade over the next three days? Uh, I think you got to be long. I mean, this is something that um, uh, a lot of the traders have taken for granted. And in a lot of ways, they haven't run in. You know, the last three bumps in oil that we saw, we saw a lot of speculative activity run into the oil market. And each time they got fooled, and we had this mini bust back down into the mid 40s. And this time, surprisingly, they haven't run in to buy oil. And that's very constructive for the markets generally. You don't want everybody long when the market starts to go forward and starts to move higher. So that buying can come into the market and continue to drive it higher. I think they've taken this deal for granted. I don't think they've given it as much respect as they need. I think this is the last time we'll see oil in the 40s. I know I've said that before. It's like <laughs> the boy who cried wolf. But I think this is the last time you see oil in the 40s and we get constructive from here and we won't see oil dip under 50 again. Uh, so, Reva, does the Saudis have themselves in a really tough position here, sort of like central bankers, that they have to keep cutting in order to maintain the market because of shale's response and they can't ever really exit this cutting strategy? Well, certainly at the current juncture, absolutely, it makes perfect sense for the Saudis to really force an extension. And uh, really among all OPEC and the non-OPEC producers that are part of this deal, the timing makes sense to extend this. And they're talking, again, about a, a longer extension as well through March 2018, which is notable. What I think we have to pay attention to, though, is that we, as we get closer to a point of rebalancing, and as those producers then start to see, well, what do I do for my exit strategy from this deal? That's actually gonna be a big part of the talks this Thursday. Russia's already sending out signals that look, we're gonna need to find some sort of understanding with the Saudis to start ramping up production again. And that's where, although you've seen pretty high compliance with the OPEC deal in place so far, once we get closer to the end of this year, you're going to start to see that cheating come into play again. Reva, fold this into the foreign policy conversation we had about five minutes ago. Here's the United States on, on one side of the story, pumping, pumping, pumping. And then we talk about a situation where the Saudis and Iran can agree on something when six, seven minutes ago we were talking about Iran being isolated in the region by the Saudis. How are these guys agreeing on anything? Well, that's the difference between market forces and geopolitics, right? At the end of the day, the, the pressures on Saudi Arabia to, to extend these production cuts, maintain a stable enough price of oil. Remember, it's still looking at its Aramco IPO in, in 2018 and is preparing for that. It's going to have to do whatever it takes. Uh, and, you know, Iran has a bit of an exemption in this deal as it's ramping up its own production. That's, that Saudi-Iran dialogue is going to become harder and harder on the OPEC front as yeah. Iran recovers its oil industry with time. Um, but for now, you know, the market forces are in place for that deal extension. Again, I think it's toward the end of the year where some more questions are going to come into play. On the geopolitical front, there are multiple multiple proxy battlegrounds where they're battling each other and now with the U.S. reinforcing Saudi Arabia, uh, the Iranians are up against a pretty formidable front here, not only with the Saudis yeah. and the GCC countries, but also Turkey as well. Dan Dicker, um, Riva using that term, whatever it takes, and earlier Alex Steele mentioned um, the central banking parallels between what OPEC is playing at. Nomura says that OPEC could surprise the complacent bears in, in the oil market. I just wonder, if I look at what the central bankers would do, they'd feed the media some suggestions as to what might happen at the meeting on Thursday. And then Draghi would come out with a bigger rate cut, come out with a bit more QE than was in the market. Set me up for Thursday. The base case now is the nine month. I'll extension. set you even further up. I'll, I'll, I'll set you up even further. I'll, I'll go down to the end of the year and then further. One yeah. thing that the Saudis have always been is transparent. They tell you what they're going to do. And they do it. And in some ways, the entire market has changed around. You know, five, six years ago, we used to stand around and laugh at the OPEC cartel. They, they had no discipline whatsoever. They cheated all the time. Now we've turned everything on its head. It's the OPEC members that have all the discipline. They go to Sarah in, in March. They try to get the Americans on board. They have the Russians on board. They're talking with the speculative players in the Vatican. I don't know if you read that story. They've had meetings with Citibank and other hedge fund players. And it's the shale players here in the United States who are pumping maniacally and trying to drive up production and trying to grab every dime of, of, of profits that they possibly can at really horrendous prices. So turning this on its head, what you shouldn't take for granted right now, which we might have taken granted for four or five years, is the discipline that basically the Saudis are showing, but all of OPEC is showing here. 
don't take that for granted. I think a lot of the traders are. I tell you, I think this is a market that's going to that's going to have some likes. But at some forward. point, there's going to be a reckoning, like Riva was just talking about. I mean, the Russians were out over the weekend saying that look, if the U.S. producers can't get on board, at some point you're going to have a battle for market share that could quote destroy the market. I'll tell you what will slow down the Americans here because we've seen it before, and it's going to be infrastructure. Uh, we've seen a lot of build out in places like the Bakken, where we've seen you know production kind of stall here. And where is all the excitement right now? Well, it's in the Permian. But the infrastructure just will not support the amount of production increases that most of these guys are planning for for the next year, two, three. They're looking for another million barrels of oil from the Permian alone, and the pipelines won't support it. And it will take a long time for that kind of build out. They're not going back to you know oil by rail. It's a mess. It's inefficient. It's expensive. I think that slows down the kind of um, ramp up in production that spoils the uh, the rebalancing that the IEA already says is here, and 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 we'll get a little a lot deeper going forward. Regional differential blow out, then you get lower prices. They have to stop pumping as permian oil is much, much lower. Favorite but you're play. going a, you're going a year down the road. Okay. Favorite play. I have two. One word. Nah, one, one, one. One? One. I go go simple. Let's go for the uh, the shale oil propping guys. Any any of the sand players will be good. Maybe emerge.